Okay. So, hey, happy Monday, everybody. So, uh, glad everyone was able to make it. Those of you in different time zones, I'm glad you switched over time zone with us. Um, surprise, yeah. So, I don't know, this one hit me like a ton of bricks. And this is supposed to be the easy one where you get to sleep in more, but it's been a hard year for everybody. So today we're going to take a step back from chemistry. Um, we're actually, we've got a couple of, I guess, light chemistry lectures. Um, and this one's really gonna be primarily biochemistry. And I wanna talk about uh, carbohydrate enzymes and how these things work. And then we're gonna switch into discussing amino acids and peptides. So uh, this lecture does rely on you having a slight remembrance of the existence of amino acids. So, what's an enzyme? It's uh, proteins that catalyze reactions. <laughs> yeah, I like that definition. That's a good short definition. And I think that's true. Um, so how does one, how does a protein catalyze a reaction? What does it mean to catalyze a reaction? So the uh, enzyme itself is not consuming the reactions. It just, uh, it, the uh, definition of catalyst is just, it doesn't really change. Like it actually changed at the beginning of the reaction, but it goes back to it. <laughs> protein, so protein remains or returns to its original state after the reaction. I'm okay with that. That doesn't explain how it catalyzed the reaction though. And this is just for any protein. I know that hopefully we're on, we're on firmer ground for a lot of you, anyone here who's more on about chemistry side. Um, this is just, you know, you talk a lot about enzymes and proteins. So, okay, so a protein returns to its original state after the reaction, completely true. It doesn't say how the protein catalyzes the reaction though. It has a special place for um, catalyzing the reaction. Okay, so it has a special place. Um, do you wanna give me some information about the special place and what makes it special? Because um, it's different for each reaction or each molecule. I mean, each um, enzyme cannot um, make any reaction happens. Okay, I, I completely agree with you. Um, so uh, let, let's let's break that down into all the components of everything you just said there, Ronas, because there's a lot of things in that statement. So you're saying each protein cannot catalyze every reaction and that that's an absolutely true statement. So I can think of two or three components to that statement of what you just said. So I think there's recognition, there's functional catalysis, um, there's specificity, there's stability, uh, there are all these different ideas, and I, I just throw out single words there, and I don't know if anyone here wants to flesh those out a little bit. Am I supposed to answer? Anyone can. Uh, yeah, they're specific. 
Okay, so how is a protein specific? Yeah, what I had in my mind, they all had, uh, as I said, they all had a specific place and active place that each molecule, I mean, they cannot mm, fit in that specific place. Okay. Which is why they're special for each reaction. So what I'm going to say is each protein has a different three-dimensional shape. And electrostatic surface. So shape, like complementarity So complementarity is made up of two components on proteins. One is shape. Your molecule, your substrate needs to be able to fit into the site of the enzyme active site. Since we're, so we're talking about proteins more broadly, this is an absolute just true statement about proteins. Proteins all have three-dimensional shape. Of course they do. Um, proteins are also highly dynamic. And so the three-dimensional shape is sampling multiple different conformations at any time. And its selectivity and specificity can vary a little bit based on its conformation. And the conformation of a protein can be induced by external factors like binding other proteins or cofactors, or you know, the protein's just floppy and is flopping around because proteins are pretty floppy. Enzymes, though, we are gonna like I, I I'm I'm fine with um with Ronas defining us to the special place. And so I'm gonna call that the active site. So the active site is almost always a cleft within the protein. It's almost always a hole. And only some specific molecules can fit into the hole. Other molecules can't. So you get specificity that way. Uh, the other big thing you have besides shape is electrostatic surface because molecules are polar. You know, some areas are negatively charged, some areas are positively charged, some areas are neutral. And the protein can match what the substrate has to be complementary to that. So we're looking for shape and charge complementarity on proteins. So that tells us, that talks about the specificity. And we can go into an awful lot more detail on this, but I think I want to hold it there. I'm going to come back to one further concept on this a little bit later. So, okay, so you can get your protein to bind to the enzyme. Is that enough for the enzyme to be an enzyme just because something can bind selectively? Still need to catalyze the reaction. Still need to catalyze the reaction. So what does a protein need to do to catalyze a reaction? Um, I actually just looked this up. I don't know if it's what you're looking for, but I found this talking about how enzyme could be the proton source or as a yeah. chemical file. So yeah, I, I think these are generally true. All proteins generally act a specific, I'm going to say what I mean by specific. This is true for every single protein. There are only four real reactions that enzyme can do. Um, metalloenzymes are a little bit different. They can do some radical chemistry, which is a little weird, but we're not really talking about those here. Um, they act as specific acids, bases, nucleophiles, or electrophiles. And by specific, I mean diffusion controlled or diffusion independent. What I mean by this is no movement limited, I shouldn't say no, 
So generally when we're talking about acids and bases, we're talking about them in solution. Nucleophiles, electrophiles, everything we've talked about so far, all this chemistry, it's all solution. Two molecules need to find each other in space, they need to orient in the right direction, and they need to hit. So you need highly reactive species. Whereas if you hold two things in very close proximity, they don't need to be anywhere as near as reactive. So sulfuric acid is a really, really strong acid. There are no sulfuric acids in proteins, right? The strongest acid we have in a protein is a glutamic acid. Um, PK is about 4.6, give or take, 4.7, whatever. Not very strong acid. But it can be held in very close proximity to the base. So although it's nowhere near as strong as sulfuric acid, normally you would need to use sulfuric acid to activate something, because that proton on that glutamic acid is being held directly over the basic atom, normally a carbonyl, it reacts. It just does. It, it can form that bond. So suddenly it acts like an acid that is like 10 orders of magnitude stronger than it is. Similarly, the strongest base we have in proteins is, oh, you know what? It's kind of like histidine. You don't have any really strong bases in proteins. Um, and that's an imidazole. And so we're talking like a pKa about 8.4 or so. It's not a strong base. But because that lone pair can be held directly over a proton, it can yank off something that would never have a chance in hell to yank off in solution. So proteins act as specific electrophiles, specific bases, specific nucleophiles, and specific acids because they're held in very close proximity. They can do chemistry that you would not think possible based on their reactivity and solution. Okay. There's one more thing that enzymes all do. So every enzyme has a unique three dimensional shape. Every enzyme, I'm sure there's an exception. I can't think of any, but every enzyme probably acts as a specific acid base, nucleophile or electrophile. It might be mediated by water. And we're going to see some examples of that where the enzyme itself isn't reacting with the sugar, but it's reacting with water, which is reacting with the sugar. And there's a third component that absolutely every enzyme must do to catalyze a reaction. Okay, let's take a step back. What does catal what is catalysis? Oh, you want us to say it uh, goes back to what it was? No, you already said that, but that's not actually important in how okay. it does it. If even something I actually don't like this first thing that we always teach this as a catalyst is something that is not consumed or destroyed in a reaction. I I call bullshit on that. I don't think that's actually true. I don't think that's actually a good definition of catalysis. You can have catalysis where your catalyst is destroyed in a reaction. I'm okay with that. Uh, but that is the, that's the definition that we teach in high school around the world. I'm sure that's what every single one of you heard, no matter where you did your high school. I don't like that definition. So I left it on here because it's still, it's generally true in almost all cases. But these other two components that we provided are absolutely true for every enzyme. And there's a third one, which is essential for all catalysis. Um, Apoorvi, you're unmuted, and I think I just got some background noise on your line. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to mute Apoorvi there, so I don't think she was aiming at us. Roshan, do you have uh, a point or? Nope. Oh, okay. I was hoping. <laughs> so what what so if we step back from enzymes in general, um, you have a chemical re no no it's fine you have a chemical reaction, and we're saying I'm catalyzing the chemical. So let's say we have a reaction. This is the uncatalyzed reaction. A. Goes to B. Energy. 
Sorry, Ronas. Decrease the activation energy. Right. And I love how you phrase that. So that is absolutely the case. That is the activation energy. Okay. So enzymes are weird. Um, uh, as, a, as an organic chemist, enzymes are weird. So let's think about this acid-base thing up here, just, just as an example, because enzymes do it, but you can do it chemically as well. How does acid and base, besides like being like, I'm, I guess we're sort of defining, hey, the enzyme needs to react. Let's step back and think about how acids and bases catalyze reactions. What do they do to catalyze the reaction? How do they decrease the activation energy? Because there's two ways we can decrease the activation energy, right? What we need to do is we need to make this difference smaller. Heat. Sorry? We should produce heat or... Well, heat doesn't change the barrier. It just changes the energy available to overcome oh. the barrier. So what happens if you add acid to a reaction? Like, let's... Like, let's say I have, this reaction. This is usually protonized uh, starting material. Sorry? Oh, proton, protonize it? Protonate. Yeah, you protonate the starting material. What does that do to the activation error energy? What are so here we have two things. We have the energy of A and we have the energy of the transition state. Protonating affects what do we normally do when we're when we add acid? Do we raise the energy of the starting material or do we lower the activate energy of the transition state? So almost all chemical and chemical catalysts, I actually can't think of an example that doesn't follow this. I would say comfortably that all chemical catalysts lower the energy of the transition state. Enzymes, though, ray often do that, but they also raise energy of starting material. And that's what makes them weird. That's why enzymes are so good as catalysts, is because they fix this by raising A up to here and lowering the transition state down to here. And suddenly that reaction just became a whole lot easier because we both raised the energy of the starting material and we decrease the energy of the transition state. So we kind of double whammied it. We hit it from both sides. That's what enzymes do. Okay. Let's think about that for a second. And we're gonna think of an example. Let's say I had sugar and I am doing a reaction to make an oxocarbenium so chemically what we've been doing is we've been adding you know H plus right and so what we do there is we protonate. And suddenly we're changing the problem from trying to expel methanol or methoxide to expelling methanol.
So chemistry gets us to here. We can protonate this. And I think you can argue that you might have increased the energy of the starting materials. I would disagree with that. I think that you just kind of changed the problem. You've lowered the energy of the transition state is how I think about that. And then this molecule must then become this form, which can then react to form the twist boat as we've been seeing. Okay, question. A or B, which one's higher in energy? B? Yeah. The ring looks more strained. It's not a chair, right? <laughs> it's not a chair. B is higher in energy. So if you're doing this in solution, this has to be a spontaneous change, right? A has to become B, but it's unfavorable. So it spends most of its time like A. A is going back and forwards with B, but most of the time it's A. And then occasionally it becomes B. And if it's B, it has the occasional chance to expel the methanol and generate the oxocarbenium. Okay. And this is why enzymes are better. The enzyme forces it into that boat shape. It, it takes it, it protonates it, it twists it into the boat shape and locks it in there so it can't spend most of its time like A. So suddenly the reaction is a whole lot faster because you're locked into the B form. So the enzyme has locked the molecule into a higher energy form than it wants it to be in, which makes the reaction easier. And that is how every single enzyme works. So one last thing that I wanted, so this is so far right now, all we've I've, I've given an example from sugar chemistry, but everything here is basic enzymology. Um, I don't think it's always taught this way, which is distressing to me because this is like fundamentally what enzymes are. But let's just think again about the, the reaction coordinate diagram. And let's say this is the catalyzed reaction coordinate diagram. It's an enzyme, so it's almost always downhill. So there's my question. What does the enzyme bind best? Does it bind the starting material, the product, or the intermediate best? Not intermediate, transition state. Again, this is a truism of every single enzyme. I love when I can actually say things are sure and universal and true. This is so rare. Because it locks the intermediate, so I would say intermediate, like transition state. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the enzyme binds the transition state best. And they do that because if they bind the transition state really, really well, they lower the energy of the transition state the most they can. Like think about the problems you'd have if you bound the starting material or the product best. Because if you bound the starting material best, you're not an enzyme, you're a receptor. You're binding a molecule, you're not changing the molecule, you're gonna hold it the same. So you bind that the best, what is your impetus to do any chemistry to it? You're just gonna hold on to it. And so that's basically what a receptor is. And some receptors have catalytic moieties near the activation site. And even there are a lot of proteins where one isoform of the protein is an enzyme that does reactions and another isoform of the protein is a receptor that doesn't do reactions. And often the difference between them isn't anything in the catalytic triad, isn't anything in the catalytic moieties. It's all because one binds the starting material best. 
And so it has no reason to turn it into the transition state. So it doesn't because it binds the starting material the best. And the problem is if you bound product best, you would do the reaction maybe, but then you would never let go of the product. And so you'd inhibit yourself, right? Because you had the product sitting in there the entire time. Um, I can't think of any examples where that's the case. There are some enzymes that bind the product a lot better than the starting material. And so they're concentration dependent. And so if you have a lot of starting material present, they will turn over the starting material. But if you run out of it, they'll start turning themselves off because they'll keep the product attached as you get more and more product present. They won't release it. They won't be able to get fresh starting material. But even in those cases, they still bind the transition state better. It's just, the transition state is really, really unstable. So it doesn't stay as the transition state because it's a transition state. Um, so it's going to fall one way or the other. But the stabilization relative to the molecule when it's not bound to the enzyme is far, far bigger for the transition state than for either of the other components. So if we compare, I'm just going to try and diagram what I just said. So without the enzyme, Actually, I guess without the enzyme, it would normally be lower for the starting material. The, well, the energy of the starting material will be lower. Let me no, Let me just think about what exactly I want to say here, because I do want to say that without enzyme in same conformation as an enzyme. Now, the starting material is never going to be in the conformation it's in, in the enzyme without the enzyme present, but let's just compare that with that. So the enzyme stabilizes everything compared to it not being with the enzyme, but it stabilizes the transition state far more than it stabilizes either the product or the reactant. And the idea is that the enzyme must bind the transition state the best, otherwise it's not going to favor the reaction. And it's either going to be a receptor because it just binds the starting material or it's going to do one cycle and then stop because it's going to bind the product and not release the product. And then it's not really an enzyme anymore because uh, it's not catalytic. It's not doing it multiple times. It's only doing it once. You know, I'm sure there's an example of a thing that goes like that. We just don't call it an enzyme. I can't think of one off the top of my head. So these are some things to keep in mind now as we start talking about these enzymes applied to sugars. Any, any questions about any of that, that basic enzyme stuff? This is maybe like the most transferable knowledge of everything else that you're doing. Cool. Okay. So I guess there are... There are multiple types of, pro, of carbohydrate enzymes. There are enzymes associated with the synthesis of carbohydrates. There are enzymes associated with metabolism of carbohydrates. We're not going to talk about either of those. Um, those are covered pretty well in um, biochemistry courses, although, again, I do think they don't talk enough about the mechanism of the enzyme. What we're going to talk about are the two classes of carbohydrate handling enzymes. So we basically have constructive and destructive. We have the glycosidases. I don't have a better way to say this. These cleave carbohydrates. So they break one sugar from another sugar.
Uh, and I need to be careful what I mean by common. It's not that they have the most number of different enzymes. It's that if you count up all the biomass of all the enzymes in your body, there are more glycosidases than anything else. More of your enzyme biomass in your body are glycosidases than anything else, which reminds us that we are essentially machines built to process sugar and reproduce. So there are, and there are going to be two classes we are going to discuss. Inverting and non inverting. The second group are the glycosyl transferases. That was illegible even to me. And so these include And again, we have inverting and non-inverting. So, we so ba basically, it makes sense. You have some enzymes that break polysaccharides and oligosaccharides up. So we spent this class so far talking about how to make them. Now we're going to break them. And then we have ones that make them. Um, it's kind of how most biology works. You got enzymes to do one thing, you got enzymes to do the opposite thing. So we're going to start with glycosidases. Non inverting. So, an example of this is the N egg white lysozyme. Which is still used as a standard enzyme for all sorts of we don't want you don't necessarily care about the function. Uh, because this was that this was the first ever X-ray structure of a protein. Uh, X-ray, sorry, pro, uh, enzyme. And that's because it's not because it's a specifically special enzyme. Uh, to be honest, it's not really an important. And well, it's it's important, but it's not an interesting one. It's because there is so much of it. Because again, if you're a, let's say you're a growing chick in an egg, one of your primary things to do is convert all the starches around you into sugar so you can start growing, right? You need your food. And eggs are, they don't have a lot of like glucose in them, right? It's a lot of higher order starches. And so you need to degrade that as you start converting protein into muscle mass become a chick so you can break out your egg and become like a chicken and do what chickens do but you know this is fundamentally true of all embryonic animals so let's say you have a the one that is really good at just breaking up uh, I'm gonna. I guess I, my example I have for whatever reason I got chitin. Don't quite know why I have chitin. I'm gonna stick with chitin.
Okay, so a little comment on nomenclature here. So the brackets just means you repeat that structure endlessly. So this is chitin. It is a polymer of beta glucose, uh, one three connected to itself, and it's or one four, sorry, and it is very very and an acetyl group here. Notice this makes this stuff form these really really rigid strong um, intermolecular interactions between adjacent chains of the sugar. And that's why, you know, chitin forms, you know, the shells of insects and a lot of scorpions and lobsters and crabs. And it's because it's a really, really hard material. And it's because of all the hydrogen bonds formed by the N-acetyl groups at C2 with adjacent OHs. And it's kind of incredible that, you know, it, it's a very, very similar material to starch. And starch is not hard, but chitin is. And the only real difference is that one's got a NAC group and the other doesn't. Um, hydrogen bonds. Anyways, so if you take chitin, and let's say this now enters into that specific pocket that Rona's or this the special place that Ronas was talking about. So I'm going to abbreviate that as Huel. So what that looks like, and we're not going to draw the whole thing, is as I said, what we're going to do is we're going to distort the chemistry, the shape of this molecule. And so it immediately takes this guy And for him to fit, he can no longer sit how he wants to sit. He needs to be distorted into a boat. Otherwise, it can't fit into the binding pocket. Now, this costs energy. It doesn't want to be a boat, right? Like, this is just bad. It's really, really high energy. but it's the only choice it's got. It's the most stable shape it can adopt in the active site. And so we have this interesting issue where we've definitely put this thing into a very reactive conformation, right? Like that is the conformation we've been wanting these things to adopt to generate oxocarbenes. We need to twist them into this boat conformation. We're saying, hey, but that's hard to do because the boat conformation is higher in energy. So you kind of need to add a strong activator groups so that whenever it does that, it pops off the leading group and that's great. Um, enzymes don't have a lot of TMS triflate in them. Actually, I can bet you that there's no such thing as TMS triflate in an enzyme. But what it does have is two catalytic residues. Glutamine 35 is sitting very close by. with the hydrogen nicely positioned right near that oxygen. And oh look,
aspartic acid 32, I guess glutamic acid 35 is protonated in nearby. Aspartic acid 32 is deprotonated in nearby. Why is one protonated and the other one's deprotonated when they're carboxylic acids? Uh, because it's an enzyme. And the although they're both carboxylic acids, the localized pK pH around those sites is not the same because they're affected by all the other hydrogen bonds around there, all the other residues. So it's a very, very complex localized structure and bulk pHs no longer apply. So unsurprisingly, we can imagine that You know, using this lone pair as we always do, nothing magical happens. We make an oxocarbenium. This guy swings up here and grabs the proton for the glutamic 35. Now, if we do that, I'm going to flip pages. We've, of course, just cleaved this bond. I'm not going to worry about what else is on there. It's the same stuff as was on there, but it doesn't really matter. And now we have an OH up here on this glutamic acid residue. But we've got Sorry. It's a spartic acid residue there, and that's well positioned to come in and attack. Now it's below the plane. So this has to go through. I'm, I'm kind of cheating a little bit. We have to flip the boat. So I'm just going to actually just do that. Because it needs, if it needs to be axial, you can't attack axial if you, on the other side, and so if we notice what we've done now is we made a new covalent bond to this. Um, sugar molecule. Now, I guess this should be basically axial here, sorry. So what we've done is we've gone from being um, yeah. being oxocarbenium and having sort of a beta linkage to now having an alpha linkage. But I said this is non-inverting. So we still have this, you know what, I shouldn't have the, sorry, I'm going to draw the enzyme now. I'm going to try and stay to, stay to this, so keep the enzyme in purple now. Glutamic acid residue is still there.
and there's water. So we've now formed a pocket there because the sugar has drifted, the other sugar has drifted away, it's left. This allows the space for some water to come in. And then we can basically use the water to do an SN2 on this. So we have water that's now attached. I guess we can keep this in green because that's where that came from. And now if you notice what we've done is we've restored the reactivity to the original one. So we've repronated that glutamic acid residue right where we started. Again, we have this aspartic acid residue as negative. Product leaves. So we've regenerated our enzyme. So here we had sort of a three-step process for this. And notice that we did this kind of double SN2. It wasn't an SN2 though, it was SN1 followed by an SN2, but the SN1 wasn't a free SN1. What do I mean by that? Okay, so in this first step, the substrate enters the enzyme. The enzyme raises the energy of the starting material by distorting its shape from the ideal. The enzyme interacts with it using substrates. So we're going to do general acid catalysis. As Hazel pointed out, we're going to protonate something. There's our proton. And as I was pointing out, normally you would not protonate a an ether auction with an acid with a carboxylic acid. That's insane. That's just that doesn't happen. But because it's held right there, right over that auction, it's got no choice. And this comes down to Ronas's point that there's sort of a special shape here because yeah, only this carbohydrate can fit in. It probably, this enzyme is also recognizing this NAC group. It's probably recognizing the way that this shape is. It needs to have openings so that these two big chains can flip out from outside the enzyme and not be in the active site. It's probably recognizing the location of the other OHs to make sure it's cleaving this carbohydrate rather than some other carbohydrates. So other carbohydrates won't fit. Only this one will fit. And then as it fits, it distorts it into this reactive conformation and it uses its active residues to conduct the reactions. So we lower the, we raise the energy of the starting material with this conversion. We lower the energy of the act of the um, transition state by protonating this oxygen here with the glutamic acid residue, which then allows for the formation of the oxocarbenium. This is what's held tightest. And we know that because it actually can occur. Um, all enzymes always hold the transition state tightly, most tightly, and the most the transition state of the rate determining step. And making the oxocarbenium ion is definitely the rate determining step. So I've drawn the intermediate here, and I'm saying it's holding it tightly. It's, it's kind of a lie. We're holding the transition state to that most tightly, but the intermediate is going to be pretty close to that transition state. Then it quickly flips it to the reactive conformation so that the aspartic acid residue can attack. Now, this is a flat carbocation. It is a carbocation. They're always flat. But we don't get SN1 type chemistry, like equal attack, top, bottom. We don't have to worry about the anomeric effect. We don't need to worry about anchyomeric assistance. There's definitely no anchyomeric assistance here because there's no acetates. Shit, there is. There is in that group at C2. There are acetates at C2. Um, they don't matter. Enzymes don't care about your stupid rules. So this is positioned here. It is locked in place. It is going to attack from this face. The, um, the boat flips. It attacks from that face. You get this proc. So although this is not an SN2, although it's not stereochemically locked, 
you're not necessarily going to get one product because it's an enzyme it's locked because of where those things are relative to one another there's no free movement then we get a symbol sn2 of water displacing an unactivated ester again i can mix an ester and water and nothing's going to happen i can take a c2 i can take a c1 acetate sugar dissolve that in water and just let it sit there for you know 10 years and nothing's going to happen but because we're in an enzyme this glutamic acid is able to strip off this hydrogen position this water absolutely perfectly to attack this and turn this over and break this ester bond and then we generate our product and we do the inversion Any question about that mechanism? Um, yes, like the first step on this slide, uh, I'm just confused why the charge is still there. Um, still on oxygen. Yeah, because I haven't actually made the, I shouldn't, so I shouldn't actually have drawn these arrows. I'm just, <laughs> I'm flipping the, I'm flipping the, um, I was going to do and I went, shit, no, I need to invert the boat. So all I've done is I've inverted the boat. And then it has all oh, that makes sense. Thank you. I'm really sorry. Yeah, Hazel is a really good point. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Any other questions? This is as hard as it gets. So we saw what happened here and it was because, let's just say, let's take a look at the inverting enzyme. Now note that there's no difference practically between inverting and non-inverting enzyme for a glycosidase because the end result is a hemiacetal. We have the OH there and that's gonna mute rotate. So it doesn't matter. Mechanistically it matters, practically it doesn't freaking matter because you get initially this OH is gonna come in beta but then as soon as it leaves, it's going to equilibrate to alpha beta mixtures, as we saw in lecture one. But we know it comes in beta. Um, the inverting mechanism is basically identical. So again, it's actually almost the same enzyme. Most of them. These almost all work exactly the same. So I'm going to just draw actually the same starting situation. Same residues, the only difference is the aspartic acid is now far away. So we follow this mechanism through. Generate the oxocarbenium. And again, we flip the chair or the boat. 
is basically the same enzyme. So in the last case, we just saw what happened here was this thing attacked. But now it's too far away. So if we space something out in an enzyme, we create a gap. What fills gaps in enzymes? Because there's a space. What's our space filling medium in for enzyme chemistry? What's the solvent? Water. Oh, look, there's space. Water enters the space. Oh, God, that's a horrible chair, and I am ashamed I drew that. And we start with an alpha. So we inverted this. So in this case, instead of having sort of a double SN2 or an SN1 followed by an SN2, we have a single SN2. We generate the oxocarbenium. Everything's locked in space. It does the same chemistry identically, except this time the aspartic acid is just a little bit too far away. So it does a water bridge instead. And it delivers water directly. That's cool. I find it cool. So the enzyme is identical. It's just something a little bit outside. The active site is identical. Everything is the same, except the active site is a little bit bigger. It's not as room for a water molecule to get in. The aspartic acid can't do the attack directly. That's it. That's the only difference, but it changes the chemistry completely in some ways. Okay, so let's think about the glycosyl transferases now. Like that's all there is. Every single glycosidase works that way. They are all using that catalytic dyad of the glutamic acid and the aspartic acid. And some of them have some additional acids and bases around there that then help get those aspartic acids and glutamic acids into the right um, protonation state. That is kind of irrelevant. Um, but that catalytic dyad is what happens for those. So it kind of makes sense when you think about glycosidase. What we need to do is we need to break an acetal bond like we are just showing there. And it's easy enough for me to think, okay, yeah, I can pro I, I've seen that we protonated things. Like that's what the Fischer esterification is. And biology can protonate things. And so that makes sense that we'd have that as our group. Now, if we think about glycosyl transferase, what we're trying to do is take a sugar with a leaving group. And we've said, I used various different leaving groups so far in this course, tons of them. And we've needed a promoter and a nucleophile. And we go to product. So
I guess theoretically, you could think enzymes are magical. The leaving group could just be OH. And it could get them in the right spot and it would all work. But that's just, it's just, apparently that's just not how nature does it. OH just isn't a good enough leaving group for this to happen. We can't make a strong enough specific acid. I don't really understand the challenge of this, but nature doesn't do it that way. What it instead uses instead is glycosyl UDP. So what is that? So the universal don't, so we've been seeing that in chemistry, we have all these different activating groups at the anomeric position. And the fact that we have so many of them is because they all suck. Biology has a single one and it, it's, they only need one because the one they have is really, really, really good. And it works for everything. So regardless of what the sugar is, I'm drawing us like a biochemist with weird ass bond angles. So that's just uracil and it's the diphosphate. So it's uracil diphosphate, which is the UDP. And so this is conserved um, across all of life. So we find it in bacteria all the way up through you know, humans. We use the same thing. Every single life form on planet Earth uses UDP as the transfer mechanism for sugars. I think, um, I don't know, I, I think we'd all be a little weird if we didn't think about exobiology an idea of like what it's like for life developing on other planets and and all that and I think I wouldn't be overly surprised I have no basis for this except just you know thinking about it that all of life is pretty similar in the universe we're probably all carbon based um, because silicon is just so freaking heavy it's the only other thing that can make four bonds and I don't think you get complex if you can't make four different bonds. And we're probably all relying heavily on water because water balances nucleophilicity and electrophilicity really, really well in acidity and basicity. Other things that are kind of in that same ballpark like um, SH2 aren't anywhere near acidic enough. And so you, would, you wouldn't get that sort of acid-base catalysis joint thing that water can do. So probably all life needs to evolve likely needs to evolve in um you know an environment where you can have liquid water so that's probably pretty common you know we've seen a lot of the amino acids and some of the simple sugars in interstellar space so they spontaneously form unless like you're like some sort of panspermist who believes that you know the universe has been seeded with the building blocks of life I think that's unlikely. I think it's just that, you know, these things spontaneously form. These are local energy minima for simple systems. And so I think there would be an awful lot of similarities. One thing I think would not be the same is I doubt that life elsewhere in the universe uses UDP as the anomeric activating group. There, there's nothing, there's no reason why you would use UDP. The diphosphate makes sense. And we're going to talk about, a little bit about why, but why uracil? I, I think the honest answer is why not uracil, um, but that doesn't help us explain why uracil. So I think that life, if we do discover life elsewhere in the universe, um, might have the same sugars, 
glucose is the most stable, the hexose is the hexoses are the most stable sugar. So the hexoses are an electros are like a thermodynamic sink for sugars. Um, and high oxidation state is the environment of Earth. So it's not surprising we have lots of oxygen attached to the carbon. Other planets might be able to have liquid water with much lower oxidation levels. And so possibly, um, possibly have a different thermodynamic sink for the sugars. But um, I don't think you would have uracil being generated as the as the partner here. There's no reason why it couldn't just be, you know, methyl. Anyways, this is what we're stuck with because of evolution. And uh, life invented it once and went good enough. I'm sticking with it. So how does this work? Well, it's actually really, really cool how we attach that on. So let's say we have a sugar. Here, let's, let's take galactose because I like galactose. So you have galactose just floating around in your body. You've just made some galactose using galactose synthase. We're not gonna go into the detail of that. And this reacts with a enzyme called hexokinase. Now, hexokinase is, there's only one of them. It kinases hexoses. So what do kinases do? Like general mechanism of action of a kinase. I actually have to look kinase up, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm looking at its translation right now, but I don't know how to say it in English anymore. <laughs> okay. Somebody else? Anyone? I know those of you in the MMB program must be talking a lot about kinases and phosphatases. Okay, ki kinases are enzymes that add phosphates to things. That's what they do. Um, all sorts of reasons we phosphorylate. Uh, often it's signaling. Often what you're doing there is you phosphorylate. You phosphorylate a lot of proteins. That puts a negative charge on a protein. So you can phosphorylate a serine residue or a threonine residue, which are normally neutral. Now suddenly they're negative. Now you're destroying the shape of the protein. Uh, and that then changes the protein from often to an active to an inactive state or vice versa. So kinases phosphorylate hexose groups. And so the re so I'm not going to go into the detail mechanism for how these things work. Um, well, functionally, they're pretty simple. They carry phosphate groups. Normally on a serine, And we're going to cleave there. So we're kind of doing an SN2 attack on serine. Why serine? Because serine isn't um, chiral at that at that hydroxyl group. Threonine is, so they never carry hydroxyl groups on threonine because you would get an SN2 on a secondary center, and it would also be um, you would invert the stereochemistry of threonine, and that doesn't happen. So phosphates are almost always loaded onto a serine. And this serine is very labile to attack. Sorry, we're going to cleave here. So the way this works is, unsurprisingly, the most nucleophilic residue on the sugar attacks, which is C6. That's still just the way it is. And as much as biology wants other things to happen, this is not useful. It's not what happens. Okay, now you will note the problem here in that we've added a phosphate, but we've added it to C6. 
which is not where we want it. We want it at C1, but it isn't at C1, it's at C6. And so this goes through a reaction with another enzyme, which is specific to each sugar. So it's gonna react with phosphogalactomutase. There's a glucomutase, a mannomutase, and a few other ones too for some of the common sugars, but there's also galactomutase. And what it does is it is a mutase, so it mutates phosphate, so it moves phosphate groups around. And the way it does that is by adding a phosphate group and then removing a phosphate group. <clears throat> so we've already phosphorylated the most nucleophilic site, so now we're going to phosphorylate the second most nucleophilic site, which is the anomeric. So all this has been shown through labeling studies, so we know exactly how this works, <coughs> or the order of this. So we know it adds the second phosphate before it removes the first one. Same enzyme, PGM removes the C6 phosphate. And leaves us with the anomeric beta. So again, you know, nature can stretch the rules, but it can't break them. So it, it wants to make this, but there's no way to make this directly. If you add in a phosphate, it's really hard to add it to C1 when there's C6 there that's being all nucleophilic and stuff. And so as much as nature wants to add directly to C1, it can't. So it has to do this workaround, which costs energy, right? You need to make two enzymes instead of one. So it's, it's interesting when nature can make something happen and when it just needs to follow the rules. And then what it does, it reacts this with an enzyme called UTP pyrophosphorylase. So uracil triphosphate pyrophosphorylase. And unsurprisingly, we're gonna react with uracil triphosphate. So there's uracil, I'm not gonna draw it back out again. It's a triphosphate. So just like ATP or GDP, except those get used for like, uh, ATP gets used for energy, right? GDP, GTP is often used in cell signaling. UTP is restricted for its use in activating sugars. Why we don't use ATP for this, I don't know. I, I, I don't see why not. Um, maybe because there's just so much ATP in the body that this allows you to have a slightly better control over when you're activating sugars and not because you're using a different molecule. So you're kind of controlling your source. I, I don't know, evolution is a lot smarter than me. It's been doing it a whole lot longer. I, I don't know the answer to any of these questions. So um, again, what we're gonna do is a good leaving group is pyrophosphate. Pyrophosphate is two phosphates. So that's that's considered a great leaving group. So we are going to attack the phosphate and we are going to liberate pyrophosphate. And so we generate UDP at that position plus PPI or pyrophosphate. And you know you got a lot of these diphosphates floating around in your body. So um, that's how we generate these leaving groups. So any sugar uh, uses a hexokinase. If it is a five-membered ring sugar like ribose, it uses a pentokinase. Makes sense. Uh, then you use the phospho 
mutase specific for the sugar. It recognizes the stereochemistry of the other positions. And this allows you to make sure that you own your, because again, this is the gatekeeping step, right? This is what's generating the active component. And so if I regulate the amount of this enzyme for each specific sugar, then I'm regulating how much active component I have that can couple into other things. And so I can make sure I'm not making too much of one sugar or too little of one sugar by changing the regulatory status of my, um, my glycomutases. And then, so that's our gatekeeper, whereas the UTP pyrophosphorylase, again, is not specific. It reacts with any sugar, just like the hexokinase reacts with any sugar. So we have the, the sort of control mechanism here to make sure we don't have too much of the starting material of any particular one, but we have this framework where we can reuse a lot of the enzymes and we don't need unique enzymes in every single case. Um, it's a really beautiful example of efficiency and control, like so much stuff in enzyme biochemistry. So it shouldn't be too surprising that our enzymes aren't really any different. So if we have a, I guess next class we'll have to finish this off. You know what, I think we'll finish this off next class. Try and draw what you think the inverting active site would look like. I'm gonna tell you that, well, I'll give you a head start here. That it bends Shouldn't surprise us too much that we have two sugars present or two uh, glutamic acid and aspartic acid present. Again, a lot of enzymes that, because of microscopic reversibility, right, every reaction can be run forward and backwards. A lot of enzymes that do the forward thing look very similar to the enzymes that do the backward thing. We just slightly change the preferences of substrates and products. And then there's a nice big spot here. for another, I don't know, I'm just gonna draw a methyl group here for now, for another sugar. So mechanistically, you can't go too far wrong if you try and do the exact opposite of what we did with the glycosyl, glycosidases. So I'm gonna leave that here for today. Um, we're going to finish this up next class and we're going to start talking about peptides and proteins. Okay. Um, thanks everyone. Have a good rest of your Monday and I will see you guys Wednesday.